Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to Prague, probably good morning to your place. Welcome to Prague, welcome to Jewish Quarter, and welcome to Old Jewish Cemetery. And I will switch so you will see where we are. The Old Jewish Cemetery is one of the oldest and most remarkable Jewish cemeteries in Europe. We can see approximately 12,000, there are 12,000 visible tombstones. And because of no space, in some places, they are up to 12 layers. The oldest tombstones, they are from sandstone, so they are black, and the younger ones from marble. This cemetery was used for 350 years, from the 15th century up to 1787. In fact, I will show you the oldest tombstone. That's the tombstone of the rabbi scholar Avigdor Kara. Jewish quarter here in the old town goes back to the 13th century. The first Jewish settlements, they were below the castle and in the new town. And in Old Hebrew, it's written on the tombstone the name of the deceased and the day, date of death. And here, this is Avigdor Kara. The original is in the museum, and this is the copy, scholar, rabbi. You know, thanks to Jewish scholars, we know how Czech language looked like, because Jewish scholars translating Hebrew manuscripts they used Czech notes, and thanks to, thanks to these notes, we know how Czech language looked like in the beginning. So Jews spoke Czech, and they used Hebrew in during the service. I will show you also special symbols on the on some tombstones. These symbols are devoted with the name of or with a profession, like here on this tombstone, you can see the picture. So the family name was Levi, Levi, or, or here there is a wolf, yes, also a typical Jewish family name, wolf. And here we see the tombstone is divided like for husband and wife. And on this one, there, are, there is a symbol blessing hands. So that's Cohen, the rabbi. In Jewish quarter with part of the old town, they were modernized in 1900s. Part of the cemetery was abolished and moved towards us. So that's why there is this wall and then some tombstones are in the wall. And also that's the time when Jewish Museum was established in 1906. I will show you there are some older tombstones which goes back to the middle of the 14th century. And that's from, they made archaeological research in the new town and they found fragments of the, of the, tombs, of the tombstones uh, in the neighborhood of Wenceslas Square. This is Clausen Synagogue, built in 1679. It's part of Jewish Museum, showing Jewish holidays and traditions. So in the middle of the city, such, such a cemetery. We will see also Rose. So that's because of female name Rosa. Or if there is a lion, there is a name Lev. 
or if on some tombstones uh, we find scissors so so the profession of the man he was a tailor yes yeah, so these symbols they are connected with profession or with a name here we see and the crown if there is a crown on the tombstone that's a symbol of wisdom so he was a scholar he read torah and another blessing hands another priest another rabbi here and this this big tomb that's the tomb of mordechai meisel he was very significant the personality he lived in the 16th century and he was one of the wealthiest person at that time he was very successful businessman and he became advisor of the king rudolf the second and king rudolf the second allowed him to build his private temple we will see his temple and he also built a town hall which we will see jewish city hall he became the first mayor and he financed a stone roads in jewish quarter he built a house for the poor a kind of hospital and a clausen synagogue we, we have a view now of the clausen synagogue klaus means small before the synagogue was built they were three little houses three Klausen. One was the temple, one was the school, and one was ritual bath. And the most significant tomb at in Prague Jewish Cemetery is this one. That's the tomb of Yehuda Liva Ben Bezalel, called Maharal, Rabbi Lev. He was a scholar, rabbi, teacher, judge, and he introduced new methods of learning, not only to learn by heart, but to combine practical life with learning and teaching. And according to the legend, he created artificial man from clay, and he mixed Hebrew letters and he called this artificial name Golem and he made Golem alive and Golem followed his instructions he protected Jewish quarter during during pogroms when Christians attacked Jewish quarters and Golem really protected Jewish quarter. When it wasn't necessary anymore, Rabbi Lev made Golem asleep. And he took out of his mouth this, his name, this mixture of Hebrew letters, and legend says Golem sleeps in the roof of Old New Temple. And when someone will find this magic name, Golem will be alive and he will follow his Lord. I will show you the roof where Golem sleeps. So Golem of Prague. This is the most ornate tombstone in the cemetery. And that's the tombstone of Handele Bashevi. She was a wife of the first Jewish nobleman. She died in 1626. After her death, her husband Bashevi lost his property so he is buried quite poorly not in prague but in in the in a neighborhood of the town mlada boleslav in central bohemia so we will leave the cemetery and this building that's a, this is called ceremonial hall it's a copy of the original house, copy from, from 1850. Organization called Hevra Kadisha, Burial Brothers Society, was founded in Prague in 1594. And they did everything concerning helping the sick, guarding the body, 
and everything as for the funeral so ritual washing praying combing cleaning and burial so this uh, ceremonial hall is nowadays museum showing uh, the work of burial prague burial brothers society so we are leaving the cemetery and we can see residential houses in Jewish quarter, Klausen Synagogue from outside the museum, and ceremonial hall. So Jewish quarter here goes back to the 13th century. And Jewish community had better times and worse times depending on the king. King protected Jewish community for collecting of high taxes. If the king was strong and the church was weak, that was a good time for Jewish community. Such a time was 16th century. Rudolf II wasn't religious. He, he was interested in science, in art, in business, in alchemy, and in the second half of 16th century, Prague Jewish community was the largest in Europe. 25% of Prague were Jewish. If the church was strong, Catholic church, that was bad time for Jewish community. Jews were forced to convert to Catholicism and they were several pogroms in the history and joseph ii he started emancipation in the end of 18th century he separated the church and the state he abolished serfdom he made freedom he issued a law freedom of religion so all people became equal as for profession and education so he started emancipation but he didn't abolish ghetto that's why jewish quarter became called and it's nowadays also called joseph in honor of joseph ii we are facing this is the oldest operating temple probably the oldest in the world old new synagogue built in 1270 and it's operating it's orthodox they say angels brought the stone from jerusalem to build this temple in 1270 and when temple in jerusalem will be built again angels will take the stone back to jerusalem a royal workshop built this temple it shows how, how important jewish community was for the kings Premisl Otakar II, his royal workshop built this temple. And uh, back uh, to, the, uh, to the history, full emancipation started in 1849. So Jews who had money moved out of the former ghetto poor Jews which didn't have money stayed. New labor workers came in. So Jewish quarter was quite poor. And that's why city planners, because there was no sewage system, city, plan city planners were afraid of uh, some epidemics. That's why Jewish quarter was modernized together with part of the old town from 1870 till 1917. 400 houses were demolished and three temples also. And these residential houses were built, which we can see here. And they were voices which were against this modernization, intellectuals said we are damaging historical and cultural heritage and thanks to these voices six synagogues survived the cemetery and the city hall it's unique in europe we are facing jewish city hall built by mordechai meisel in the 16th century rebuilt in the 18th century and we see 
on the top of the roof, the crest of Prague Jewish community star of David with a hat and the clock with the Hebrew dial, which goes the other way around. And one street which survived from original Jewish quarter is this one. It's called Cervena, red. So we will take it. And Jewish Museum was established to, to protect all these Judaicas because um, Jews built temples in other districts of Prague and uh, temples in Jewish quarter became empty. We can see the crest of Prague Jewish, uh, Jewish community. Well, in Jewish quarter, there are two active temples, this one, Old New, and Spanish. So Old New is Orthodox and Spanish is liberal. Mark Bodval, the US physician and artist, he found his Prague in Prague. He found his temple in Prague. He said, my temple is in Prague. And he made for this temple several Torah curtains and Torah coats. So, you know, it's interesting combination, modern curtain and modern Torah coat with historical building. So Mark Bodval, before COVID, he visited really very often Prague and he had he has very honorable seat in this temple and as you can see here there are the stairs so that golem can come out golem sleeps in the roof and interesting corner here we see the city hall high synagogue next to the city hall there is a high synagogue also built by Mordechai Meisel this high synagogue is also in use for the members of the city hall and this is Art Nouveau this is a residential house built in 1907 we are in Paris street one of the most expensive streets this is Prague Champs-Élysées let me show you here another interesting building. Prague Jewish community nowadays has 1,500 members. In the whole Czech Republic, 2,700 members. In the park, there is a statue of Moses. And Interesting Art Nouveau building built in 1911. When they finished all these uh, residential bell houses, then the Jews came back, Christians came back. Now, who can afford lives here? Huh? And on this building, it's interesting that the first buyers of the flat put their portraits like the rabbi with his wife uh, uh, not the rabbi the banker yes the the newly married couple the horse keeper the scientists so they are portraits of the of the first owners of these flats nowadays movie stars uh, successful actors they own apartments in Paris Street. During communism, of course, everything was uh, confiscated. People could own only small flats of certain size and also houses of certain size. But when communism finished, property was restituted. Also property of Jewish museums. So, so uh, five synagogues are owned by Jewish uh, uh, museum. And, uh, and the active synagogue 
lots are owned by a Jewish community. So also this property was restituted, what was confiscated by communists. Prague, Champs Elysees, yes, street, that's why Paris, Parishka in Czech, the street with linden trees, lime tree. Uh, a linden tree is a Czech national tree because the heart, the leaf, looks like a heart. And probably you know in Berlin there is a tree, Unten den Linden, and that's because uh, Slavic people also lived in the neighborhood of, in, in that part in Germany. Uh, and we are going to see another temple called Spanish, which was built after modernization in 1869. In a Jewish quarter, there was no square for markets. This street we are now in, called White Street, Shiroka, served, had a purpose of the square. So they were markets here and also, also processions, processions to welcome the king, you know. So Shiroka Street, so here there is Shiroka Street. Look at this one. This building looks like a, like a castle. Copy of historical styles. That was fashionable at that time. Neo-Gothic, Neo-Renaissance, Neo-Baroque, and also Moorish style. Moorish style became very fashionable. And we will see in a moment Spanish synagogue built in Moorish style. On, on the place where Spanish synagogue is, there used to be a temple called Alp Shul. Jews came to Prague when Prague started. That's 10th century. And Alp Shul was built by Eastern Jews, which came from Byzantine Empire in the 11th century. And Here there is a Church of the Holy Spirit. So they were Eastern Jewish community, Christians, and where the old new synagogue is, Ashkenazi Jewish community. There was Ashkenazi. And in fact, uh, these two communities assimilated in the 19th century. Huh? So here we see the Spanish one. So Alt Shul, old school, was modernized when the reform Judaism was introduced in the middle of the 19th century, but still capacity wasn't enough. So that's why Jewish community decided to demolish old school and to build Spanish synagogue. We, uh, this is the statue of Franz Kafka, we will see it properly in a moment, I would like to show you first the front of Spanish synagogue. The example of this temple was a temple in Alhambra. Oh, let me show you the main facade of the Spanish one. The organist in this temple was František Škrob, who composed Czech national anthem. Spanish synagogue is very beautiful inside with the organ, there are concerts, there are weddings, concerts of Gershwin, and it's part of Jewish museum showing history of Prague Jewish community or Czech Jewish community from Joseph II up to nowadays through <clears throat> tragedy of the Holocaust, uh, life of Czech Jewish community during communist time and up to nowadays. And uh, also prosperity of Prague Jewish and Czech Jewish community in the second half of 19th century and uh, before World War I. 
yes, successful entrepreneurs like Ludwig Moser, you know, the best Czech crystal, uh, that's Moser, Ludwig Moser founded this crystal factory in Western Bohemia. Uh, Karlsbad, Karlovy Vary, or Emil Kolben, who was the famous electro engineer and he electrified Czech railway and he established a factory in, in Prague manufacturing streetcars and wagons and locomotives. He was very important electrotechnician. He also, he was friend with, with Edison. He visited many times United States and also he invited Thomas Edison to Prague. Uh, Emil Kolben perished as 80 years old man in Terezin concentration camp and he couldn't understand what people he what people did to him and he did so good to all people and how how he finished that was really terrible <clears throat> Czechoslovak government uh, during protectorate during world war ii wanted exception for emil kolben you know but uh, the whole family had to go and only one his grandson survived the holocaust and during communism he had to work in the factory which grand his great grandfather founded he had to work as a worker many years this is the statue of one of the most influential prague jewish writers franz kafka franz kafka sitting on the shoulders this is probably this is a this is because of his novel history of one fight the weaker sits on the shoulders of the stronger he felt himself as a weaker you know and the stronger that's probably the bureaucracy of austria hungarian empire he he the whole life he was searching for the sense of life probably the most famous story is metamorphosis how a man became a cockroach and all he all his main heroes he wrote about himself and all his stories are depressing because he felt he he felt like that another story is called another novel is called verdict the father hearsed the son and here there are railings that's the railings of the bridge where the son jumped out of the bridge and commits the suicide this bridge is in the neighborhood and franz kafka lived next to this bridge so in fact where he lived where now hotel intercontinental is he wrote the most successful novels he wanted to destroy all his work he wasn't happy what he wrote and he said to his friend max brot to to burn all all his work franz kafka has tuberculosis and on his deathbed, he asked Max Brod to destroy all his work, with the exception of six novels, which he evaluated and which he thought they were good. Max Brod promised him to do that, but then he published his work. After uh, 1924, when uh, Franz Kafka passed away and uh, Franz Kafka became known, especially when communism finished. During communism, we didn't learn about, about Franz Kafka because, because his stories are depressing, like the whole communist regime was depressing. So that, uh, that's why uh, communists uh, didn't want Kafka to be published. But Kafka became very popular after 
communism and now there are several several statues and cafes and Kafka, Franz Kafka tour, Kafka way of life, you know, Kafka's Prague. And <clears throat> why he became so popular? Because really, uh, he, uh, he described very well different life situations. And we are going to see Pinkas uh, temple and Maisel temple. So as you can see, uh, the life is now good in Prague. It's not necessary to wear face masks. Everything is opened and everything got back to normal. Pinkas synagogue, which we will see from outside, was built by Horowitz family. Horowitz family was one of the very important families in Prague. And uh, by the way, Horowitz means, that's the name of the town in the neighborhood of Prague. So that's also one way how family names started, that uh, people, Jewish families took the name of the towns where they lived. So, uh, because Joseph II, you know, he, he issued a law like mandatory military service so all men had to be registered in the army in in the end of 18th century and jewish families which used only hebrew names which which had hebrew names they had to change their names to for joseph the second understandable name it meant german name because german was a school language uh, during uh, Joseph the second time, during Habsburg time, in fact. So that's how people became Horowitz, Brandeis, you know, Brandeis, it's a town in the neighborhood of Prague, Rosenberg, which is a town in southern Bohemia, where there was a Jewish community. So we have these family names because of the towns, yes, people took the name of the town. So that's the wall of Old Jewish Cemetery and Pinka Synagogue, built by Horowitz family later on, it was owned by family Pinkas. And in 1959, it became a memorial of the Holocaust. When Czechia, Czechoslovakia was occupied by, by a Nazi Germany, the main Nazi here was Reinhard Heydrich and Heydrich was, he was called Prague Butcher and he converted garrison town Terezin, 40 miles, 60 kilometers to the north of Prague to a concentration camp. Small fortress became Prague Gestapo police prison and Big Fortress became a Jewish ghetto. And all Jews from Bohemia and Moravia had to move to Terezin ghetto because of conditions. 25% of all prisoners in Terezin concentration camp perished in the camp because of conditions, 35,000 people perished directly in Terezin. And Terezin had a, was a transit place. There were 63 trains which left Terezin to extermination camps built in Poland. Mostly these trains were going to Auschwitz-Birkenau. In the second, on the first floor of Pinka Synagogue, you will see children drawings from Terezin. Friedelicker Brandeis, the teacher of art, she was the teacher of art in, in the concentration camp, and she hid her suitcase with 4,500 children drawings in Dresner Barracks. 
she hid it in the wall and the suitcase was found in 1945 and children drawings are exhibited in Pinka Synagogue and they are also exhibited in Terezin uh, Ghetto Museum. For the Nazis, Terezin also had propaganda, propaganda purpose. Uh, Seven, inside Pinka Synagogue, you will see more than 78,000 names of more than 78,000 Czech victims of the Holocaust. And this is, this is Meisel Synagogue. We are in Meisel Street. Meisel Temple was built in the second half of 16th century by Mordechai Meisel. It was restored in the end of 19th century and restored recently. And it's a part of Jewish Museum showing history of Czech Jewish community from the 10th century to Joseph II. And inside you will see there is a Langweil model of Prague. Langweil, he was a bookkeeper and in 1830, Six, he made paper model of Prague, very detailed. And this paper model was digitalized. And thanks to this digitalized, thanks to this model, we can see how original Jewish quarter looked like. All these narrow streets and original houses and uh, all the temples which were here. So it's very interesting. And also, This museum shows the manuscripts. There was very good yeshiva in Prague, Prague yeshiva, with handwriting books, which goes back to the 14th century. The first Hebrew prince, there was a very good printing school in 1500s in Prague. So original books, original manuscripts, exhibited in Meisel Temple. And in Meisel Temple also you will see hand embroidered Torah curtains from mostly 16th, 17th century. Prague Jewish Museum has the second largest collection of Torah curtains after Jerusalem Museum. So definitely, if you will be in Prague, Jewish Museum is really worth visiting and uh, you will see lots of precious objects. This is the building with the green dome. That's the new city hall built in 1912. And we will see another statue of Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka, he was introvert. He had problems with communication. I will show you where he was born. The whole life he lived in the Jewish quarter and in the old town. That's his bust. He was born here in July 1883 in this, on this place. From original house, this balcony, and the entrance and the balcony survived because the house, there was a fire, the house was burned down. Originally, this building was for the monks of Benedictine order because this is the church of St. Nicholas, which is nowadays, which is nowadays the Protestant church because Joseph II, who was reformative king, and he started emancipation he didn't like wealthy church so he abolished many orders and he expelled many orders so this is a square of Franz Kafka and there is another statue made by Czech Jewish artist Jaroslav Ron Rona what would you think this statue this 
statue is called it's called reader uh, probably also it represents Franz Kafka so the main city hall and we will see the main square Old Town Square the heart of the city with the main church these two spires that's Teen Church, Our Lady in front of Teen. It's an active church, Roman Catholic. You know, Czechs are one of the most secular nation in Europe. Only 10% of people are Catholic. Most of the churches are Roman Catholic. 90% are secular. Fourteenth century church, and it's called Thien, T Y N, because behind the church, merchants had to pay the tax. They got royal seal, and then they could sell their goods at the square. So the main plaza. This is the Paris Street. So that's the way to Old New Temple to Jewish Quarter. and Kinski Palace, yes, the pink, the pink palace. Count Kinski built it in the 17th century when there was a communist putsch in 1948. Clement Gottwald, the right hand of Stalin, he had a speech from the balcony of this palace. So lots of historical events happened at this square. In the middle, there is a statue of Jan Hus, John Huss. He was a reformer of the church and he was burned at a stake in Constance, which is the border of Switzerland, Germany, in 1415 because the church proclaimed him as against God. He was before Martin Luther and after his death, Hus, his followers were called Hussite, and Hussite movement started. Hussite battles. And si then when Martin Luther criticized the church, then we are talking about Protestants, yes? So in fact, Czechia, Bohemia had the first Protestant king in Catholic Europe in the 15th century. And let's now we will have a view of St. Nicholas Church, which is nowadays a Hussite church. It was also once Russian Orthodox when uh, there were many Russian immigrants after the revolution in 1905, the first revolution. And this is the old city hall. As you can see, half of the building is missing. Prague is lucky. Prague wasn't bombed du uh, during World War II very little damage in comparison with other European cities. And there was a uprising against Nazis, which started 5th of May 1945, and German tanks shoot it on the city hall, and uh, half of the city hall was burned down. They were different projects, but no project won to finish it. And on this city hall with a watchtower, there is astronomical clock, which we will go to see because that's also one of the highlights in Prague. But we have few minutes before the apostles. So I will show you the clock and there will be, if you have ladies and gentlemen, some questions, I will be happy to... Yeah, uh, Lucy, we have, we have about uh, 569 questions, more or oh, less. Oh, really? So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so let me, so this is the clock. Yes. Uh, that's a, the mechanism is from 1410. So very unique clock and the, the watchtower. Yes, so I will 
switch to my style. Wow, well, this is, this is oh. first off, I want to say very so quickly, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. This uh, has been eye-opening and, and so, so very informative. We've had so many comments just sharing um, wonderful accolades and congratulations. So thank, thank you, you so very, much. very much. Thank you. A lot of these questions are specific about names, about dates. So please feel free to go very quickly because yes, I was exaggerating. We don't have 5,000, but we probably have close to 50. So there are a lot of questions. Um, what is the name of the cemetery that we started at? The, the cemetery is called Old Jewish Cemetery. Okay. Old Jewish Cemetery. And where is, the where is the grave of the golem's author? In the middle, we, we stop there, and there is, a, there is a symbol of lion, because the name of the creator was Rabbi Le, Le, lion, yes. Yehuda Leva, Leva also, it's like Le, Yehuda Leva Ben Bezalel. So, so that's in the middle of the cemetery, and he died. He passed in 1609. So the date is also on the on the grave. Got it. And there's a question about if the tombstones were moved or relocated because they seem to be so crowded together. Well, in the cemetery, they uh, they they didn't. Uh, it was strictly forbidden to touch the tombstones, but they put they put more soil, and they buried another people. So the stone was pushed up. Yes. So uh, there are approximately twelve thousand visible tombstones. So we don't know exactly how many people were buried there, but definitely much more than twelve thousand. They say probably 100,000 people within 350 years. And, but in 1900s, they needed more wider streets and they moved part of the cemetery and they put it to the top of the previous cemetery. So that's why on part of the cemetery, we've seen the hill and the wall. Got it. Thank you very much for the explanation. Okay, thank you. When, you, when we left the cemetery, you showed us a clock that was going backwards. Were those Hebrew uh -huh. letters? Hebrew letters? On the Hebrew, clock? Hebrew letters, yes. Okay. Hebrew letter, letters. And uh, this clock, also, that's from the 18th century. The city hall was rebuilt in the 18th century. Got it. So, um, another question is. Uh, uh, I don't know the name of the person who asked the question, but they're saying that their friend's dad was the rabbi in a place called Karlsbad, with a K. Do you happen to know if that shul, that synagogue, still exists in Karlsbad? In, in Karlsbad, in yeah. Karlsbad, that was one of the most beautiful synagogues in the world. There used to be a great temple which was unfortunately destroyed during so-called Kristallnacht in on 10th November 1938. Got it. Got it. And and we in just the middle of the spa because uh, Karlsbad had uh, relatively large Jewish community, you know, Ludwig Moss, that is the uh, founder of Crystal Factory. Also, there is a local spirit, like Jägermeister Becherovka, David Becher founded this factory. They were very uh, many important people, Jewish personalities in Karlovy Vary. The spa exists, the factory of Becherovka exists, the factory of Moser exists. Jewish community nowadays in Karlovy Vary is very small. Got it. Um, there's plenty more questions. Marie, Mariana Greenblatt is wondering, is wanting to know when did the Spanish people come to Prague, the, the Sephardic Jews? Uh, in, the, in the 11th century. Oh, wow, very early. Yeah. 
Um, another question is uh, someone is saying that their third great grandfather is the famous Wolf Pacheles of Prague. Do you happen to know this name? As, have you heard of Wolf Pacheles before? Maybe not. Yes, I will find out. I don't okay. know. We'll, 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 we'll do the research on Wolf Pacheles. That's for, for whoever asked that question, please. We're going to put the email of Lucy for everyone um, so everyone can follow up with Lucy. We, we, we love creating and inspiring connections. Um, the question next, Lucy, is are Jews treated well now in Prague and the rest oh, yes. of the Czech, country, yes. Czech Republic? I don't see, I don't see any anti-Semitism in, in Czech Republic. And I think that's uh, connected with really people are not religious at all. And, and so this is uh, really, we appreciate, we have now good democracy, but we have many problems. Yes, we will have elections uh, in fact uh, in two days. Two days time, wow. Uh, yes, on 8th, on 8th of October, we have parliamentary elections and um, so we have lots of now problems and there is a question of uh, immigrants, there is a question of uh, we have a very big state deficit and uh, lots of corruption and you know we have lots of problems. Lucy, I'm just going to interrupt you because I know we're one minute away from 12 noon. Can you maybe turn the camera and can we see the clock? Because I know that there's something Definitely. special that happens at 12 noon. So we should all be paying close attention, right? Exactly. So we'll, we'll be on the lookout for that. That should happen any minute. And for those who want to stay on a little bit extra, we have a little bit of time to get through the questions. Um, I will find a good spot. Okay, you keep looking for a good spot. Um, <laughs> we already have some questions. I'm gonna put your email in the chat, Lucy, if that's okay. So everyone oh, yeah. can get in touch with you, which is which is lovely because we hope that you know tourism will will come back uh, stronger, uh, you know, uh, safer in 2022. Here's everyone's email, everyone. Info at lucytours.com. Another couple questions, Lucy. How many people do you know if people have come back to see their original family homes? Oh, six o'clock. Yes. I remember this very well when I was in Prague. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Can you zoom in? And the tower, the bell now will, will ring 18 times. Well, in fact, the bell will ring 17 times because according to this clock, we should have 5 p.m but we have 6 p.m. because of daylight saving time. <laughs> Unbelievable. They, they didn't consider daylight savings time when they built. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Lucy, we only have a couple more minutes because we're over the hour, but I want to make sure that we get a lot of uh, uh, questions in. So the, the last question was, do you know if a lot of people have come back to see their original family home? And uh, you mean after World War II? Yes. Yes, they were survivors which, uh, which came back to, to Czechoslovakia, like Helga Weiss, you know, Helga Weiss, she's 91 years old and she lives in the same apartment the whole time she came back after the war with her mother. The father perished and 
mother got bad health. She passed away soon after the war. Helga Weiss studied in communist Czechoslovakia. She married to the boy from a strong Catholic family. Communists persecuted them because of religion. And she became illustrator. She illustrated books of Arno Schlustig, Arno Schlustig, survivor of Terezin of Auschwitz. He was a teenager and when he came back to school and he said to his friends and to the teacher what happened, the teacher answered uh, him that he, he, the teacher didn't believe him. So Arno Schlustig decided to write about it and Helga Weiss illustrated his books. George Brady, George Brady, a survivor who, who came back to, uh, to his home, to his house as the, the only survivor from his family. But then, because of communis communism, he decided to leave and he, he lived in Canada. So, uh, you know, they were survivors which came back and then because of communism, they left, they, uh, they exiled. Got it. Thank you so much. We have uh, a couple more questions. I'm going to ask one more question to, 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 to wrap it up, which I think is important, uh, the question. Uh, but before so, I want to re-share Lucy's email, because I know there were very specific questions uh, about great grandfathers and, and, and rabbis and, and, and detailed questions. I want to let everyone know, uh, once again, we, we, but, but, but on the behalf of Lucy and all of us at, at Lucy Tours and Jewish Mallorca, thank you so much, Julie and everyone at My Jewish Yes, Learning thank for, you so yeah, much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, I'll have some announcements at the end, but I just wanted to say this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And, and we're just going to quickly share, for those who want to keep on learning and keep on traveling the world virtually, um, you know, this October, we're offering a special program with Jewish Mallorca that, that, that My Jewish Learning knows about, which is Jewish Mallorca tours. So those who want to learn about the Jewish history of Mallorca, we have this free registration opportunity starting on October 12th. Um, and we have a four part series where we're going to go through all of the history of Mallorca um, and learn about the re exciting revival that's taking place today. And we also want to encourage uh, those, you can see it on my, my background, JewishMallorca.travel. Um, you know, we also are going to go to closer to home. We are going to North America. So we are going to go visit um, different uh, communities in Alaska and in Puerto Rico, which is a part of North America, uh, Hawaii and New Mexico to learn about the crypto Jewish story there. So please feel free to get in touch. I'll put my email there. Julie, of course, has our, our contact info as well. And the last question that we want to ask, uh, Lucy, tell us about the active Jewish community today in Prague. How many synagogues are actively working and are not just a museum? What's the size of the Jewish community that's participating in events today? Uh -huh. Approximately, Prague Jewish community nowadays has 1,500 members and, and Old New Synagogue is active, it's Orthodox Spanish. Spanish Synagogue is rented by, by organization Beit Praha, and they, they are liberal services, and there is Jerusalem Temple in the new town, beautiful Moorish, Moorish Temple, which is also active, and it's also Orthodox. So there are three active temples in Prague. And I would say uh, from 1,500 members of Jewish community, 1,000, uh, 1, they visit the temples.